dedicated to Henry Farman. In the year of the primal war, the war Welcome, my friends, to episode 190-something of Agitators Anonymous. I am Alan Averill, your hostess with the very least that you can imagine of a Friday morning. Is it Elevenses? Is it Tiffin? Who knows? It's just before lunchtime in Greenwich Mean Time. That is where we are here from Dublin in Ireland. Coming to you. Yes, indeed. God, I seem to have been possessed by the spirit of some 1950s radio presenter. Well, what do we talk about today? Well, it was going to be an article. It was going to be, let's say, um, well, it was going to be either about hate speech bill laws, but I did that a month or two ago, but there's been a lot happening on that. Please remember, monsters do not exist. Um, or I'm going to talk about Spotify. All right, then, let's talk about Spotify. Well, actually, what I'm going to talk about is this a map that lots of people shared with me, which is the most, pop, uh, the most popular metal bands um a kind of uh, spotify accumulation of spotify streams uh you know who was the biggest metal band from each country streaming um in 2024 i'm going to talk about that and some of the interesting um mathematical statistical observations that come from it i do like me some um maths to get stuck into and just some interesting and curious observations about the different about different countries about um, bands that you thought might be there who aren't there what does it mean overall does it really matter not really but sort of in some kind of way so that's what I'm going to discuss we can keep the hate speech for next week for another time so let's keep the hate speech talk for another day we can do it next week um, it's not really a pressing concern or a pressing matter is it well anyway so, the show, as ever, a few housekeeping bits and pieces. The show, as ever, is sponsored by Metal Blade Records, which is the home of Primordial. You, of course, need that bastard olive Irish green version of the new album. Follow the links below and go to IndieMerch.com slash Metal Blade Records, and you can use the promo code AA2024, and you can get 10% off your order, which, believe you me, in the modern age where the exponentially rising costs of everything are going through the roof. Postal rates, all this kind of stuff. 10% uh, is worth quite a lot, especially in North America, where we are coming soon to play some gigs, a Maryland Death Fest. And the first four shows, five club shows, I think, uh, we've played in over 10 years in the US and A. So there you go. Get prepared. Use the promo code below. Um, what else? Follow me on the Instagram, Nemthiang underscore Primordial and Primordial underscore official. Primordial just released a new video for the song Death, Holy Death. Um, a five and a half minute song from the new album based around a kind of crawling bass riff that Paul came up with. Um, really cool song. I like it. A joy to sing over. In fact, the singing was just one take, if you can believe that. Um, but... Uh, we mixed that song in with um, the movie Joan of Arc from the early 1920s, which fit very neatly into the theme of the song. Go and take a look. It's over on uh, Metal Blade's YouTube channel. It's actually somewhere on my YouTube channel as well. Um, I appeared recently on the Steve Hughes Seriously Funny podcast. Comedian Steve Hughes is um, kicking ass out there in Australia with... He's super organized now. Go and check out his YouTube channel, Seriously Funny. Um, that's where the interview with me and him was last week. But you get to look at our ugly mugs this time over on YouTube. Over on Patreon.com slash Alan Averill, you can go and support the show. Um, and there's plenty of other things you'll probably get. And um, probably, probably, definitely. There's other podcasts which don't make this podcast. Um, early, uh, you listens to of lots of different things. There's rehearsals. Uh, there's songs that haven't been released and they appeared on lots of different things there. I just put in my name, Alan Averill, Agitators Anonymous, AA, whatever you want, um, and you will find it. And there are no tears because I can't quite figure it out. Well then, let me read this from the site Loudwire. Um, a map that's been shared online shows the most popular metal band in every country right now, according to data from Spotify. Um, and then they go on to say, firstly, we give a shout out to Reddit user such and such and such and such who took it upon themselves to pull all of the statistics from Spotify and create the map. Now, I must say, as I, the reason I decided to do the podcast about this is because so many people shared it with me, because obviously Primordial appears as the most popular Irish band, um, which I'm not entirely sure is correct. Certainly, we are the band who have the most 
um, amount of streams per song. We have lots of songs that are two and three plus million streams on songs, which is more than everybody else. But Gamma Bomb, for example, have more monthly listeners than we do. Um, so I'm going to try and explain what the data means, or at least try and take a sideways look at it and what the implications are. And does it really matter? But so many people shared this map with me that I thought, all right, let's do a podcast on this. Let's talk about it. Um, so the article continues. I was looking for a list of the most listened metal bands of each country and there wasn't one. So I did the work by myself and created this map. Now, the first thing to consider about this is this this work is that um, it's not that difficult, really, if you weren't that into metal to do, you know, Google searches or DuckDuckGo or whatever uh, you are using to go most popular metal band in each country. But if you don't know every genre of metal, if there, if you are, let's say, splitting hairs about what is and isn't metal, um, then it can you can start to get, I think, caught in the weeds here. Um, so if you don't know that many Irish metal bands, um, maybe you're you know, the list of bands you were choosing from uh, wasn't, you know, wasn't full. Um, do you know all the metal bands from Lithuania, from Latvia, from Estonia? Is there something missing? But by the looks of things, when I look at the map and go through, and I've done the job of going through lots and lots of the band names and putting their uh, monthly listeners, uh, you know, writing them down here so as to give me better explaining and talking points. So let's have a little look. First thing to consider, as I said, is, um, is the... Is the test including all points of data, i.e. have you put every band in? Is there something huge that you're just not thinking of? Because some of the names are a bit surprising, um, and some of the names are really, really surprising, which I'm going to get to, and you think to yourself, that can't be correct. But then there are lots of other cultural, geographical, linguistic, um, and regional things to consider. Like, you would have looked at this map and gone, who the hell is Elysion? Um, surely they cannot be the biggest Greek streaming band, but yet they are. Rod in Christ, um, I would have taught, thought off the top of my head, must be Rod in Christ, right? No. Rod in Christ come in at under 200k monthly listeners a week. This band, Elysion, has 320,000. But I've never heard of them, and I've certainly never seen them at any festival bill. Rod in Christ is obviously a bigger band, and that's one of the things you realise considering this list, is that there are plenty of bands who are just sort of regional heroes, we would say, hometown heroes, um, and that ha don't play in other countries. So Rodden Christ is clearly a bigger band than um, Elysion, but for whatever reason, Elysion um, seemed to be streaming a lot in Greece. It's not impossible. Maybe they had a, a few hit songs, uh, maybe a, a video that was played all the time on Greek TV. Who knows? I don't really understand or I don't really know well, I, it's not that I don't understand. I'm just going through the reasons why this could be the case. But I don't know their backstory. So, but they have over 150,000 more monthly streamers than Rotten Christ. More than Septic Flesh, more than all the other big players in the Greek uh, metal scene. So what could be the reasons for that? Like I said, they could just be a band who are only big in Greece. Who Maybe they've never played in Germany or Holland, or they've probably never appeared at Vakken Open Air. And there's no doubt about it, there isn't probably a band on the planet who tours as relentlessly as Rotting Christ. So they cannot be as well known as Rotting Christ. I mean, the fact that um, it was one of the biggest talking points of this list of this map um, would would suggest that that is the case. So what are the reasons why something ends up like this? So um, in the comment, I'm reading again from Loudwire, the individual explained the map shows which metal band is the most listened to in every country based on their Spotify popularity in 2024. Now I presume that's now that makes things a bit more complicated. That doesn't mean um, does that mean they are monthly streaming numbers only um, when that person looked because they they fluctuate wildly. I mean, Primordial, um, if you if you looked just when we released our album, it would have been 70, 80, 85, 90,000 monthly listeners. And then slowly that ebbs away and you go back down to 50, you go back down to 45 or whatever it is. Um, but this methodology here seems to suggest that this person has taken their streaming numbers over the year of 2024. Um, Maybe, maybe that's just the wording here. I don't know if you're. I don't know if that's possible, um, to access that data. I think if you're Spotify, um, for artists, it is. Um, you know, you can go in and look at that data. But however, well, uh, the methodology isn't entirely exactly explained. But what they've done is, 
not their overall popularity as in going back through um, the previous years but for 2024 alone so it's a very modern look at which bands are the biggest around the world and going back to the article here we've included images of the different regions of the map below and thanks to XXX user and listed a couple of bands shown on the map um, so notes about the map so for example there's also a couple other things to consider and this is um, in the notes about the map for example they found this is what it says in the article they found Sabaton to be the most popular band in Sweden um, but noted that Ghost would be the correct answer for those who consider Ghost Metal. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I would consider Ghost Metal. Why not? There certainly are bands on here that I wouldn't exactly consider Metal who have been volunteered for other countries, so why wouldn't Ghost be Metal? So on those terms, um, Ghost, it would appear, is bigger than um, Sabaton. And for the record, you probably hear me turning pages there, that's Ghost is sitting at... 7.9 monthly million listeners, uh, which is really impressive. 7.9 million. Um, and Sabaton, 3.2 million. I mean, both of those statistics are equally impressive. And to be honest, um, you know, once you start to dig into the numbers of some of the um, second or third world, let's call them that, or, you know, developing countries, they really, um, it shows how far statistically ahead that the north of Europe is. Although there are some really interesting anomalies, and I'm going to get into them. They go on to say in the article, another example is Volbeat, who has marked or who was marked the most popular band in Denmark. For anyone who doesn't consider Volbeat metal, King Diamond would be the answer. Um, or would it be Merciful Fate? Um, let's just take a look at that. Volbeat, who I never liked, I must admit, I always found the vocals far too overbearing for the music. Anyway, they have five million monthly listeners. That's goddamn impressive, right? King Diamond is 134,000. And Merciful Fate is 162,000. Um, so the person who's written this article, well, they've made a mistake there. They've said King Diamond would be the answer. King Diamond is not the answer. Merciful Fate has more listeners. Um, so what does that mean? Does that mean they don't know Merciful Fate? Which then would suggest to me the validity of this whole exercise. But anyway, then I wouldn't have a podcast, would I? But yes, so... There is a legend in the bottom left corner of the map that has numbers for countries which were too small to fit the name of the band, which notes that all of the greyed out countries do not have data for their most popular metal band on Spotify. So look, if you want to follow what I'm talking about while you're listening to me, just put in most popular metal band every country and this article will come up. It's on all the major metal sites because they love this kind of thing. Somebody else has done the work. And you can then just discuss it and, tell, uh, you know, uh, mull over the details, which is exactly what I'm doing now. So <clears throat> the most popular metal band in the US right now. Well, look, the most popular band of the whole aggregation of this whole thing is Metallica. Metallica sits at 25.6 monthly listeners on Spotify. Now, to just put that into comparison, you should go and put in some of the pop bands or hip hop or what you want to see. If you want to see who... Um, rules the roost when it comes to Spotify streaming numbers. Put in Drake, put in Ariana Grande, put in Dua Lipa, put in all these people. Um, of the top 400 streaming artists, I don't think Metallica even gets in there. I think they're like 327th or something. Um, what this whole exercise really does prove when you dig down into stats is how little metal matters in terms of the street the big big streaming numbers it's its own very um it's got its own ecosystem obviously you know and festival culture and metal is second to none i think but and um, what it really does show is um is that metal doesn't stream much compared to other artists or other forms of music why is that well it's complicated um i think one of the reasons why is that in a social media culture that is dedicated to the cult of personality, to the narcissistic impulses of social media where music has become a backdrop to your life, not the soundtrack to your life. Let's be clear, um, marketing a boy band or a girl band or three or four or five faces in modern social media terms has become uh, much more difficult. You'll notice when you look at a festival bill, if you're a little bit older, you look at a festival bill and it all is just names of people. They're not bands. They're not boy bands. Not even as we grew up within in the 90s um, or the 80s. There is no pop bands with names anymore. They're just names of people because that means they're much easier to brand and market. So metal music um, is just a kind of a digital marketing, marketing anachronism. It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, because like, say, Drake or whoever you want, who is the biggest streaming, um, I think, artist of, the, of this century... Um, and can I just say that uh, any other 
if any metal band had said some of the things that Kanye did, they would be, I think, deplatformed and cancelled. But Kanye can go on Infowars and say how much he loves, um, you know, a certain German leader from the 1930s. And everybody goes, ah, look, he's just having a mental break. Um, huh, he's fine. And we won't remove him from any of the streaming platforms because there's just too much money involved. Um, and also, he very obviously was having a, some kind of psychotic break. But anyway, that's not the point. Um, don't let me get sidetracked. But when you do actually break into the numbers, it's clear to see Metal and Rock represents a tiny percentage of overall Spotify streaming numbers. Now, people don't really realize that, but when you pay your monthly subscription, this doesn't go to the bands that you stream. It's one of the reasons why so many bands make so little from Spotify. Um, Spotify streaming uh, income is, dist is like a sliding scale percentage ruling, which is the overall success of Spotify and the streaming numbers um, are very heavy gradiated, gravi they gravitate very heavily towards all of the biggest streaming artists. So huge artists make lots of money. I think it's like 0 0.00008 cent per stream. Um, bands in the middle make literally nothing. Um, I don't think I've ever gotten a streaming uh, royalty bill that's ever been allowed to, you know, for me to use for anything practical. And you can go online and you can see that Primordial has some songs that I think were great and men have fallen is 3.4 million streams. Um, anyway, the point is that once you really dig down to the numbers, you go, oh, wow, okay, metal really doesn't have much purchase within this sphere. I think that's one thing that's very interesting to note. The other thing to note about Spotify is that um, the percentage of streamers apparently, now this is according to some other uh, some some other details that I found, is that the uh, streaming numbers are I think s almost 60-65% female to male for Spotify. Now I'm sure that doesn't count for rock and metal but overall um, it means that um, there are more um, women using Spotify than men. Now, I don't think there's more women using Spotify than men to listen to metal, but it's an interesting thing to observe. Um, and also to say that if you're a band who still sells physical copy, which Primordial does, if you're a band who sells lots and lots of vinyls, if you're an electric wizard, and people are playing that vinyl rather than streaming online, so you are actually, by selling physical product, you are missing out on streams. Not many, but some. So if Primordial still sells, um, you know, I don't know, four or five thousand vinyls or whatever it is, I don't, to be honest, I don't really check these things so much anymore. Um, uh, you know, those are people who would otherwise be streaming. So sometimes it can reflect that your band is, um, you know, appealing to people who are perhaps 40 and over that your numbers aren't competing. You take a band like Slaughter to Prevail. Um, a super sort of brutal down tuned I don't know what you would call this death core or something they have 1.2 million streams and that's coming out of Russia now I would assume they're Russian but not living in Russia and those are 1.2 million streams uh, counted among, mainly outside of Russia I don't know if you have Spotify in Russia I don't actually know if you have Spotify in China either so that makes it all, uh, even more impressive, actually, because what are their streaming numbers on music platforms within Russia? Who knows? So let's have a look at some of these details and um, some of the strange things that it throws up. I must also add, before I start that, does, does do the numbers matter? <clears throat> yes and no. I was having this argument, well, actually not an argument, but a uh, discussion with my good friend JB from the glorious Grand Magus uh, from Sweden. Um, epic metal. Uh, one of the best voices in heavy metal. Um, and at the moment, they have 20,000 monthly streaming um, on Spotify. They don't usually play the social media game much. But we're talking about what does it actually, what does it really mean? And maybe one of the few places where it does mean something is in terms of if you're um, trying to get booked on a festival um, and the festival hasn't really got that much time to do much digging into who you are. Um, did you get 400 people in the venue um, near, uh, you know, in the area on tour or, or 800 or 1,000? Or did you get 40? Because if you, there are plenty of bands out there, believe me, who have like 200,000 monthly listeners on Spotify, but they could not pull 50 people to a venue. But that takes quite a lot of digging in to find. So, and you've been there at a festival, probably. I've been there at a festival also where um, X band has come on and everybody in the crowd knows, hmm, they're not as popular as the band two bands before. And all of a sudden, mm. the crowd kind of parts and you're left with 20% of what was there. But yet, if you were to look online, said band has 200,000 
uh, monthly listeners and you go, oh, okay, that's very interesting. Me and Joe from Gamma Bomb discuss this um, on one of our um, one of our podcasts that we do. We were looking at the band Heathen. Now, I really like Heathen, first two records, and they had something like 220,000 monthly listeners. And I think to myself, my God, um, a headline Heathen show would have, you know, 50 to 100 people at it. But yet they have 200,000 monthly listeners. And I know bands that, well, a Grand Magus, show, Grand Magus have 20,000, but a Grand Magus show could have three or 400 people at it. So it doesn't always tell the whole story of the popularity of a band. There's no doubt about that. But sometimes festival bookers, they do look at these things. So um, if you have 100, 120, 140,000 listeners, monthly listeners, it, it does benefit you. Like it should work in your favor. Um, because somebody would look at it and go, oh, they seem reasonably popular. Um, wow, cool. Okay, give them that 6 p.m. slot rather than the 2 p.m. slot. So it does matter in terms of opportunity. Um, I'm not going to say it matters in terms of money because unless you're streaming millions and millions and millions and millions of times, um, then it really doesn't make any difference to you financially. But certainly in terms of opportunity and also um, just how it reflects on the band. Um, it sort of reflects on your popularity. Or, of course fuck it it doesn't really matter at all which is fair enough also i accept that point of reasoning but that wouldn't give me much to talk about on today's podcast would it it can also point to the fact that sometimes um, and i see this with promoted with the new album the streaming numbers uh, the album was received strongly by people who liked the band um, but there was no really breakout song whereas the previous album had to hello the hangman which had a big spike in listeners um it just happened to be a sort of kind of like a breakout song this new this new album doesn't really have a breakout song and sometimes that's what happens um people especially younger people will just stream one or two or three songs over and over and over and over and over again you've probably seen um young people doing this you've probably seen yeah young kids doing this where they just play the same song over and over again so if you have a song that gets picked up by tiktok for example People are, um, I don't know, doing whatever they're doing to it there. I'm um, trying to, you know, mime something in the breakdown that apes the video, uh, like Lorna Shore or whatever, you know. Then you will see, um, you will see those numbers spike as people are listening to that song over and over and over again. Does this mean that song eight on the album gets listened to much? Probably not. So there are bands out there who are two or three or four or five songs um, heavy. As in, it's it's like a sort of um, a seesaw, so to speak, in that you've got a couple of songs that really tip the balance for them. But are they going to keep people's attention for a 90 minute show? I'm not sure about that. Do people know um, many other songs? So, again, it's a double edged sword. If you're an album by album by album band of people who are really invested in your back catalogue, then things will be a bit different than that. I may also add that it is possible to cheat. Um, there are methods, there are dark arts to gaming uh, Spotify streaming numbers. It's not uh, as easy as it is apparently on YouTube because you've all seen videos of bands, um, you know, I don't know, some obscure Italian power epic metal band from some small label that has 7.2 million views. And you're like, hang on, what? What? How is that possible? Mm, I am suspicious. However, that is possible on YouTube. It is possible on Spotify, apparently. I don't know how to do it. I've never looked into it, obviously. Um, or else we'd have much better numbers. But um, no, it is possible. So you also have to take that into account. But I think these numbers are relatively, um, relatively truthful. So let's take a look at some of the countries and some of the things that are really quite surprising. So as I said, Metallica sits at the top of everything with about 26 million monthly listeners. Now go and just have a look at that and then go and start typing in some of your um, kids' pop and hip-hop names and you'll be like, wow, okay, Metallica has no numbers to compare to these people. A band called Spirit Box in Canada, never heard of them. They look awful. Um, they have 2.2 uh, million listeners. Now, if you think Rush is metal, then Rush is the biggest band from Canada. Um, and Rush, because Rush has 4.9 um, million or something like this. Um, so, Spirit Box. I mean, okay, whatever. I don't know what that is. But yeah, they are. Um, they're the biggest band from Canada. You move down the list, and some of the uh, South American ones are really quite interesting. Sepultura has 1.7 million. And then uh, Kraken from Colombia, 1.47 or 147,000. I was about 147 million. No, 147,000, which is really interesting. Because if you compare it to Criminal from Chile, which is 8,000, uh, Defonia from um, Peru has 11,000. 
Crystal Gates, which looks like Argentina, 5.7. So um, Kraken, who I've never heard of, uh, sorry guys, um, have a big number. Does this mean they're, and this really does mean they're streaming that many in South America, in Colombia, and which is a linguistic and is a geographical thing. So sometimes you get a band who are like really popular only in one country, who don't really have much crossover appeal. Now, other than a Sepultura who are like looming large over this map in South America, literally none of the bands mentioned. Criminal, which is, you know, ex-Pentagram guys, um, my mate Anton. Uh, Rata Blanca, okay, I've heard of Rata Blanca. Um, but by and large, those all those names in South America haven't really crossed over to Europe other than the Sepultura. Now the bands who have, Sarcophago, Crisio, and all this kind of stuff, they uh, are obviously having to deal with the huge behemoth that is Sepultura that sort of sits on top of everything. Um, let's have a look at the rest of the... Let's have a look at this other stuff. UK, Black Sabbath. Yeah, I mean, look, Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath has... Um, he turns paper. Um, it gives you some extra sound effects to this uh, article. Um, Sabbath is 14.9 million, which is 10 million less than Metallica. But it's twice as much as Black Sabbath. So that means per month, um, Sabbath streams 15 million times, Iron Maiden 7.7. Now, who else could compete with those? Um, no one else. Um, I will say again, as I said before, um, Sleep Token were the biggest streamed band in metal apparently last year, but they still don't register because they have to go up against Black Sabbath, um, which would make, which would alter um, the methodology I mentioned at the start of it. So maybe it's not as not as exact as I thought. So you're f it's full of these um, curious anomalies. Germany, Rammstein. Is Rammstein heavy metal? Yes, I would say so. Um, where is Rammstein in my scribbled list of notes? Um, Rammstein is 12 million. 12 million monthly listeners. I mean, it's big. Um, but, you know, Ramstein pulls more people, again, like I said, to stadiums around the world um, than, you know, hip-hop artists who stream 100 million, but that's just how it goes. Scorpions are 13.7 million, which is actually bigger than Ramstein um, from Germany, but this person obviously hasn't doesn't count the Scorpions as heavy metal. Um, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, certainly the Scorpions is heavy metal adjacent. It's right next to heavy metal, especially Blackout or something like this. Um, interesting. Gojira, yeah, okay. I don't mind Gojira. Um, I think I have from Mars to Sirius somewhere. Got lots of Morbid Angel Abominations bits in there. They have 1.9 million, which is really good for a new band. Um, and yeah, I mean, they are a really, really big modern band. It's really quite impressive how huge they've become. And they've done it in a way, uh, you know, playing this kind of modern style metal. But it's, it's you know, compare this to something like Parkway Drive in Australia, 1.7 million. Um, or as I said, Spirit Box, I'm going to keep picking on them. I mean, this is just rubbish stuff compared to Gojiri, you know. So we have Behemoth in Poland, 438,000 monthly listeners, which is pretty impressive for a death metal band. I mean, looking at the list, they're the only death metal band, I think, um, you know, across across this list. Dimmu Borgir is in uh, the biggest streaming band in Norway, which is 479,000 um, monthly listeners. Again, not clipping half a million. But that would suggest that Dimu streams more times a month than Behemoth does, which if you'd looked at the profile of the bands of the last 10 years, um, you wouldn't have imagined so. I mean, we're looking at Ukraine. Ginger. Ginger is 757,000. So Ginger is streaming three, 400,000 times more than both Dimu and Behemoth per month. Interesting. And they're a brand new band. I remember playing somewhere in Romania in a castle with them and there were several bands under us and you could tell something was about to happen with this band not to my tastes really really not to my taste but again a kind of modern band that when i watched live i thought to myself yeah i mean well you know it's not it's not gimmicky gimmicky um there's some you know excellent musicianship going on um Nightwish is 2.7 monthly listeners i mean yeah this makes sense Nightwish have Nightwish have albums that have sold over a million physical copies back in the day. Some of them, I think, a million and a half. People forget how absolutely huge this band was until it, it sort of broke later in the UK and Ireland and America, I think. Um, and people forget that this band were huge. They are huge. They're one of the biggest. And I don't know, really, if they tour that much anymore, play that much. Um, but they were absolutely massive. Now, let's talk about this top-heavy bands. 
I mean, there's a band called Windrose from Italy, 950,000 monthly listeners. I mean, it's an existential horror, this band. They have a song, Diggy Diggy Hole, which is apparently something from some computer game. Yes, I sound, I sound like an old man. This one has 55 million views. And then, you know, the rest of the songs fall away. And they have a song called Drunken Dwarves. I mean, look, if it's the kind of thing you like, fair enough. Um, but... Uh, you know, this is obviously a band that appeals to a very young audience and they keep streaming that same song over and over again. I can just picture, um, you know, some excitable 15 year old just clicking again and again. But, you know, it's a new band. What am I what am I doing? Somebody they had written originally Lacuna Coil in this box who have six hundred and seventy nine thousand monthly listeners, which is interesting for a band who's sort of big albums and they sold a quarter of a million physical copies I think in the early 2000s they still have that many listeners it shows that you know people stick around so there you've got two example interesting examples Lacuna Coil doing this sort of central media gothic metal end of the 90s early 2000s who've kept their listeners um their monthly listeners they you know they obviously still have a very loyal fan base and a band who have become big on the back of um, a song that is lifted from a computer game for whatever that's worth um, two very interesting modern concepts um, but both thriving reasonably well in the modern Spotify world what it does show is when you dig down into some of the artists that are from um, North Africa, from the Middle East from developing countries they very much have only a couple of thousand streams um, the, the whole thing is turned on its head by the band The Who the H-U from Mongolia who uh, the, the first time I saw them, I thought there's something else going on here. Are these guys from Los Angeles or something? Or um, I'm probably wrong, but their videos were so well manufactured. And it screamed a lot of money and thought has gone into making um, The Who. And they're just huge. And they have like one point, they have 1.7 million or something. Um, and then you have other bands from, you know, countries around them. Ula, Ula Tan from Mongolia has 12.8 thousand um and you know you I, mean, I do wonder what lieback are doing there they're not metal at all but you've got asia in the middle east you know bloody wood one hundred ninety thousand, nine nine treasures and um, thirty eight thousand. baby metal is 2.1 million for all you woody allen aficionados in the metal audience you know what that's what that's really about don't you um anyway lots of bands here that are popular that i think shame on you if you like them <laughs> oh please have better taste um so old man shouts at clouds uh, baby metal come on anyway there's lots of really strange things and like i said the who is a really curious thing because it has it i think this band got huge on these you know huge production values involved in their videos but there they are 1.9 million monthly listeners for the record, Bathory has 200,000, Candlemass 171, Celtic Frost 117, and Coroner 40, uh, which leads us into Switzerland. Elovete have 864,000, so seven times the amount of monthly listeners that Celtic Frost has. But there is one absolutely insane anomaly that almost broke my brain when I looked at it, and that is Mago de Oz, um, the Wizard of Oz. Spanish band have 3.9 million monthly listeners like um, and to put that in comparison Nightwish is 2.7 so Mago de Oz has 1.2 more million more monthly listeners than Nightwish have you ever heard of Mago de Oz you probably wouldn't because they sing in Spanish and this is something that was very popular in hip-hop and um, in rap and there's Latin music that we just have no clue about in Western Europe and Mago de Oz are basically like the rock um, example of that they're huge I presume they're playing to stadiums of people in Mexico and South America um, uh, but you know do you know them have you heard of them do they tour in Europe I wouldn't imagine so do bands from Eastern Europe and developing countries have a chance of becoming popular in Europe? Well, yes, I think they do. Look at the popularity of Ginger, um, the popularity of The Who, the popularity of, well, I see Solstice here there in Iceland. Um, there are bands that are popular in um, in Western Europe and, in, you know, that are from um, other countries. Alien Weaponry from New Zealand have a lot of listeners. Um, I think it's uh, 150,000 or something. I mean, it, let's be honest, it should be ulcerate if there was a just world, but that's not the world we live in. If that was the world that we were living in, but it sadly isn't, of course. You know this, you know this. So what can we really take from this? Um, well, we can take, I suppose, the fact that I probably should have done a podcast about um, 
<laughs> hate speech laws, and that this one just appealed to the um, vaguely autistic mathematical processes within my teenage brain who used to love facts and figures. Um, I said it before in the podcast that when I was a young teenager, I used to sit and I was obsessed with American football. And you're getting a little insight into my childhood now, but I was obsessed with American football, not necessarily exactly with the games, but with the statistics. And I used to work out projected statistics for the next year um, based on the statistics of the said year. American football, uh, I don't know if you ever watched American sports. There's so many more metrics by which they measure um, everything. Um, it's kind of insane. And so I was obsessed with American football statistics and then would work out every single game um, and uh, calibrate, calibrate, you don't calibrate when you're 11. But I used to then imagine every single score, who scored things, all the yards rushing, all the yards passed, and for your, for our, my American listeners, and then make projections of all of the stats for the, um, the year ahead, and then compare them when that year had happened. So that's the kind of um, idiot savant child you're dealing with. Um, and so, of course, this article piqued my interest um, because it's got lots and lots of maths involved. And of course, it has primordial involved. Um, even if perhaps it's not exactly true. But um, it's very fascinating to me, these numbers. Does it ultimately matter? No. I mean, look, it doesn't. I mean, it's a race to the bottom, if you want to call it like that. Um, we've often talked on the podcast here about how unfair Spotify is. And I mean, it is. Like I said before, a couple of weeks ago, I remember my argument I had with um, this Swedish guy who was a big fan of the Pirate Bay, not a musician, but his argument, this kind of utopian ideal that all art should be um, free and that the idea that we have a barrier between artists and the people who like that artist um, should be removed. Of course, ultimately, it ends up with um, the idea that uh, Spotify really just um, pays as I said, the sliding scale percentage rule pays only the very few people at the top. Of all the people who have, um, we've mentioned in this, you've got to be in the millions and millions and millions, like 5 to 15 to 25 million streamers with huge songs to really be getting any money from that. And I'm sure, pretty sure, there's probably a guitar player of Ghost or a drummer from Nightwish who isn't making any digital royalties because they didn't have any songwriting credits. Um, and don't forget, of course, um, if you're an electronic artist working in the basement and uploading music straight onto Spotify without a label or third party in the way, then you're getting all of those um, royalties, all those digital royalties. How it works basically is that there's a couple of distribution companies. They're called TuneCore or CD Baby, for example. And these are third party companies pretty much owned by Spotify. You can't just upload music to Spotify. So let's say you make an album. Um, and you want to upload it to Spotify, you will find that you have to go to TuneCore and you will have to pay about 40 or $50 for that album per year. Now, it's a calculated risk on behalf of Spotify that you will never make more than the amount of um, in streams than the amount of money that you pay to upload the album. So um, perhaps you didn't know that. I don't know. Perhaps you did. But you can't just upload an album for free. And of course, don't forget that if you are a band signed to a label, then you can't just do that as a band. Um, you have a contract. You have all sorts of um, you know contractual issues that stop you doing that. You can't just do what you want with the songs. And so it's the label who uploads that. And then the money will go directly to the label. And then, of course, your share of that as a band, which could be 30%, 40%, 50% of the digital, will then be sent to you. But, of course, with Primordial, everything is split by five before tax. So um, this is why... Of all of the, if you added up all the millions of streams of primordial songs over all the years, um, and I don't know how much it must be. There's quite a lot of songs that are a million to three and a half million streams. Um, what you will, um, what you will find is that it literally makes no <laughs> economic impact to any of our lives. So does does it all matter? No and yes. And like, if you're out there worrying about it as a band. And there are better things to worry about, really, like just being a great band. <laughs> and there is an underground. There is an underground that will uh, accept you regardless of all of this. If you're good enough, you're going to get to play cool festivals like Chaos Descends and Muscle Rock and Sinister Purpose is on this weekend. Aim for that. Don't be bothering with all of this statistical measurements. It just appeals to me because that kind of thing appeals to my brain. But in the mainstream, 
It kind of does matter, and that's where Primordial has sort of peaked its head above the parapet to glimpse into the mainstream. And what else can we gain from this? What else we can gain is that all of the biggest streaming bands um, are from the West and from Northern Europe mostly. Um, they're not all old legacy bands like, you know, Sweden is not Hammerfall, it's not Europe, it's not Ingrid Malmsteen. It's, it's a new heavy metal band, um, a new equivalent to Iron Maiden, an awful equivalent to Iron Maiden, but one nonetheless, Sabaton. But it also shows us, uh, and it shows us that across the developing world, there are bands, um, you know, they've, ha they've had a late start at, that, at most of these kind of things, but technologically speaking, um, they're moving. And I'm really fascinated with what's happening in the African scene. Um, there's a brilliant documentary by the band Overthrust from Botswana, who came and toured Europe and played at Vaca, and it's really brilliant to watch. Um, you've probably seen those photos, the heavy metal cowboys of Botswana. Amazing stuff. So I, I quite often go on YouTube journeys trying to look at bands um, playing shows in those countries. I'm really fascinated by that. Some stage I've got to go there and see a show. Um, North Africa, Morocco. I've been in touch with people there about Primordial trying to play, fell through. Hopefully some stage before we hang up our boots, we can make some of those things work. So those countries are, they're coming up. They're definitely coming up. And, and then, as I said, there's anomalies like The Who. I mean, is The Who really even metal? The songs I've heard all sound like Warriors of the World, but with those kind of different instruments, not distorted. I don't know. Could they be metal? They just happen to have fallen into the metal scene. Um, so there's definitely something there for you know developing countries to move up and use the technology um, because that's how they're reaching people like me looking for these bands, searching for bands from, um, from Africa and the Middle East and stuff, um, which is a great journey. And you can only hope that improves. And that's uh, so. There's two different things going on there. There's the, the you know the, the sort of gross bloated capitalist model that's uh, evident in the West, and then developing countries using this emergent technology to to reach people like well like you and like me. And it also shows me that my own band is kind of stuck in the middle. Um, for a country like Ireland, a developed country that has a population of you know four and a half, five and a half million people or whatever it is, and um, we aren't. Um, proportionally as big as we should be from other countries. There's other countries, bands who are, you know, streaming in the millions or monthly listeners in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. We should be bigger. It shows you, well, it shows me in a way what, um, how rock or metal is treated within my own country, um, which is kind of like um, you're the perennial outsider, you're the perennial pariah. It's not really part of our mainstream culture on any level at all that the biggest rock band in the country would be as relatively small um, on, a, uh, on a broad scale as it is here. But yet at the same time, there are plenty of other countries all across Eastern Europe who are further behind with their biggest bands than we are. Um, like I can just mention some band E-A-N-A, -A, Iana, Romania's highest streaming band is 20,000. But they're brand new. They're really young. They're, it looks like six or seven years old. Promoted exists for 30 years. So they're, you know, well, anyway. So ultimately, my friends, Agitators Anonymous, I am Alan Averill. I thank you for listening and putting up with my, um, uh, you know, statistical um, obsessions, my <laughs> interest in numbers. And I will get back to some serious stuff next week because let me tell you, there is some serious stuff on the horizon for you. Um, when it doesn't matter which country you're in, all these kind of laws are coming in soon and we got to talk about them. But for now, this is a kind of fluff piece about me um, and my interest in numbers and statistics. Hope you found it interesting. Ultimately, just concentrate on making great music and support um, the bands that you find that are making great music, either over the merch stand, at a gig or in Bandcamp. Bandcamp is realistically the only um, equitable platform try and buy things from there otherwise enjoy yourselves and planet satan this transmission comes from over and out agitators anonymous <laughs>